Good afternoon, and I should say a big thank you to all of you for, for giving me your time, which I always consider to be your most valuable resource. So, so thanks a lot for, for making the time. Uh, thanks to the introduction, I'll just compress my, uh, my background a little bit and then get straight to what I think in my mind are some of the uh, key elements that don't really get discussed when you are dealing with startups. So I've done chemical engineering, I did my MBA, I actually had worked in frozen foods, I did four startups. My last one was acquired by Yahoo, where I then joined to become global partnerships, head of global partnerships. And since then, uh, since July of this year, I have left Yahoo. So today I'm a free agent. The, when we were in my own startup, as well as when I advise a whole bunch of startups, we kind of break down the startup into four components. A lot of discussion happens around what the product is, what the technology is, but perhaps not so much get discussed around what is the culture for execution and how do you think about the business. So my goal today is to really break this down into very tangible action items, things that worked for us, things that did not work for us, and not necessarily that they are applicable to, to everybody and every startup, because you are in your own trenches, but as a founder, you definitely want to be in the mindset of you are the chief architect, and you don't want to just find yourself one day into some, in, a, in a situation where you did not think it through. So let's start with culture for execution. One of the things that we did at, in my previous company called Cool Iris, we broke it down into rather than thinking of culture as a buzzword, we said let's break this down into the very specific components. And the three components that we broke it down into were collaboration. Again, not a buzzword, but basically as we were doing all the recruiting and we were building the team, as we are, you know, people talk about like, oh, A, you need to bring on A players. By the way, and I don't know any startup that says we want to bring on a B plus players, but that everybody thinks they are going to bring on A players. But the one important aspect of that recruiting process, we also try to gauge how good of a team player she or he is going to be. And this was important because there were many a times where we found this is a great, very relevant talent, but at the end of the day, the collaboration piece was going to be missing. And at that particular point in time, the cost of a wrong hire for a startup, it actually ends up being much more than the cost of a no hire. It's very difficult to say no to somebody who you feel you found them, but because they're not going to be collaborative in, and, and you actually go through that process of, of figuring it out. The second component was component of meritocracy. And meritocracy is important because as you go through the age of the startup, you know, in year three, year four, you never want the next talent who you're going to recruit to find out that, oh, I already have so many people ahead of me, so how much room is there for me to grow into? So meritocracy, where you are going to be gauged by your performance, and this is across the board, founder, CEO, any person within the company. And this was important to establish meritocracy right from day one within the company. The third element is the element of trust. Again, to break down what trust really, really means, in our particular case, my employment contract was exactly the same as every single employee that came that we were recruiting. And I could, not the numbers, we would always say my numbers are different than your numbers, but the flavor of the contract is no different. And the reason for that is when the time for acquisition comes, you want the team to be in your most cohesive state. And that can only happen when you know all of you, the entire team, has effectively, there are no special privileges being assigned to anybody. So this is how we had taken the culture for execution and componentized it to make sure here are the things. I'm trying to go a little bit faster here because I want to cover on the business side three very important things as well. So on the business side, we, I'm going to break it into monetization, fundraising, and m and On the monetization piece, you know, just to, uh, to think about how you think about a dollar, or uh, euro in this case, first level said it's important to have a dollar compared to not having any dollar, okay? So just let's just get our basic facts right. But when you do have it, there are three ways to think about it. The first dollar is your equity dollar. And equity dollar is something, you know, which is great, it's, it's important, you need, you, you heard so many speakers here talk about it, but you have to remember that it is a dilutive dollar. 
meaning you get it, but you are also giving up your equity in exchange for taking that money. So it's good, but it's also you're giving up something for it. The second dollar is a scrappy dollar. And scrappy dollar is typically you find a lot of startups who are you know, doing something. They're doing, if especially more on the B2B side, or sometimes a B2C company, but they take on projects because you are trying to generate revenues. And generating revenues is not a bad thing because it's now helping you extend your runway. But remember, the second dollar, which is not so as good as the third dollar, and the third dollar is what we call as, or I call as an aligned dollar. And the aligned dollar is the one where it actually amplifies your enterprise value. And amplifying your enterprise value, giving you the runway, and that is not dilutive, that is the dollar which is what you're really seeking. And it's important to distinguish those three because as you are thinking about decisions, even in terms of product development or, or any other decision, you are thinking through Am I going to be earning this, and is it also going to amplify my enterprise value, or is it just going to only extend my runway? So that's on the monetization side. On the fundraising side, again, I, in my mind, there are sort of three key takeaways that, that I felt were important for, for especially founders to know. The first one is don't be in a rush to label your round. Okay? And what do I mean by that? Uh, we made one mistake, you know, we went straight to Series A. And, and then, of course, by the time we did B and then we did C, we had raised $29 million. But by the time you are in C, you are assigned a certain expectation around what does a C round company means? What are your metrics? What are your revenues? So if you are still in the process of trying to figure out what your product market fit is, and in today's day and age, especially more so relevant, Give yourself enough of a wiggle room where you can actually do a pre-seed, you can do seed, you can then... So by the time you are in A, you actually already establish what the product market fit looks like and what it is. And very, very important for you because it can also help you if there's one thing that you can actually benefit from, you know, hopefully from this is not... It will actually help you save your own dilution. So you are not going straight into A and then assigning the, the, the metrics of A. So if you can do a pre-seed, a seed, and be even more creative, A prime, before you go to B, then, then more power to you in terms of how you think about, about fundraising. So that's number one. Second point on the, on the fundraising piece is on thinking about your board. Your board selection is extremely important. You know, don't take it too lightly. It, it becomes just like you are thinking about diversity on the team, diversity of talent, diversity of background. You really want to be thinking about diversity about the board. The board has been created for the governance of the team and the company, but at the same time, you as a founder are thinking about how to leverage the board for your own benefit. And by having a board which is much more well-rounded and not just only from the investor side, is very, very useful as, as you grow uh, into the journey of success. The third important point during fundraising is on, the, is on the element of runway. Most companies, or, or even entrepreneurs and, and investors, when you talk about runway, your expectation is this is the runway of capital that we are discussing. But equally importantly is the runway of patience. And this runway of patience, I know so many startups where you run out of the runway of patience. And this could be the patience of your spouse, could be the runway of, of your colleagues, of your investors, your board. So as you are thinking about runway, of, runway for the company, it's not just the runway of capital, but also the runway of patience. The last topic I want to touch is on the M&A side, on mergers and acquisitions. You know, as, as a founder, if you're going through your journey, I think it's, it's, very, it's very relevant and it's, very, it's important that you look into the mirror, whether it's your year two, year three, whatever, uh, and you say, at some point, I know I'm not going to be able to go public. I think there was a speaker here from London Stock Exchange who did a fantastic job to show that you can actually go public on different stock exchanges. But if you do believe that you're not going to be able to go public, then you know that your m and is probably your only other choice in terms of what success means. If you have reached that point, where you know that uh, getting acquired is the only choice, you, again, as a founder, owe it to yourselves that you absolutely need to build relationships 
with your target, the top 10, 20, whatever your number of a potential acquirer is going to be. But again, a key thing that we learned from, from my journey or I learned from my journey was, it was I ended up having a lot of relationships with Corp Dev people, you know, because Corp Dev within the bigger organizations are the people that, that really facilitate the M&A process. But what I had missed was you also need relationships with the deal sponsor. And typically the deal sponsors come from the product side. So you as a founder, you as an entrepreneur, if you're reaching that particular state of mind that M&A is probably your, your only viable exit strategy at this point, you want to invest your time in developing the relationships, making them aware of who you are. Obviously, you're not revealing your secret sources, but making them aware, them as an the cop dev, as well as the product and engineering folks in the target companies is worth your investment. I have one minute left, so I'll, I'll try to also make it quick here. The, uh, I'll jump to, to, the, to the last point, because this is also very important. The last point is on your data room. So as you're going through the m and process, they will say, hey, you need to open up a data room. And we opened the data room when we actually got the term sheet for an acquisition. Big mistake. You need to open the data room the day you start your company. And, and the reason for that is from the time you sign the term sheet to getting the deal closed, for us it took 52 days. And those 52 days is something that I felt we should have compressed a lot. Because during that 52 days time frame, you are carrying a lot of risk because you have already signed an exclusivity agreement with the acquirer, but you want to make sure that the deal actually goes through. So remember one thing, rather than thinking of a, now is my startup and I'm going to now start the data room when I get the term sheet for an acquisition, start your data room the day you start the company. So anyway, I, I wanted to make sure that I, I come here and not give you some generalized guidance and advice, but some specific points to think about. Maybe they're applicable, maybe they're not. Again, you are the founder, you're in your own trenches you really want to think of yourself as a chief architect on all the dimensions, not just product, not just engineering, but also the business side and on the culture for execution. Okay. So, so thank you, Jaljana, thank yeah. you. And now we'll move on to the questions that will appear in front of you on the screen. And please ask more questions through slido.com. Okay. So James is asking, how do you find out if a candidate is a good team player before you hire them? So one of the things that we did is we always felt the interview process was a little bit bullshit where you just brought in somebody, asked them a question, and then say, yeah, you're hired or so. And it was actually unfair even for the candidate. We got them to spend a full day with us, and we actually, you know, this is post signing of the NDA, we said, okay, we're gonna actually treat this as if you are in the company, and we are actually gonna deal with you given the problems that we are currently facing. So it was effectively a working session for the full day, and sometimes we went overboard and actually said, if you want to invite your beloved ones or spouses and let them come in and have lunch with the team, it's also cool. So really getting to kind of accelerate the relationship into what, and, and simulating what the relationship will be is something that we used to do. It takes extra effort and extra time on the part of the CEO, the founder, but it is, as I said, the cost of a wrong hire ends up being much more than the cost of a no hire. So definitely worth the investment in making that happen. Any additional tips for increasing trust in the team? Esco is asking this question. Really, you know, this is a very, very important point. At the end of the day, we, we were in the, in the, the cool iris for seven years, and 100% of the company then ended up joining Yahoo. Trust is so fundamental, but none of that just comes only through words. It all comes through actions. And the example I gave, which was, you know, my employment contract is the same as yours, the numbers are different, but the flavor is the same, is one way to tangibilize it. But every other thing, you know, anything that you do, if you say that you're gonna do and then really making it happen, it takes some time to build the trust, but the, but the employment contract at least gets it started, gets the journey of trust building started on both sides. Uh, what are the most important documents of a data room? Juso is asking, the, you know, look, every different company that is acquiring you has a, has a huge dog, uh, due diligence list. But, and, and every, of course, company that is acquiring will have a different due diligence list. 
but it's not that hard to find out what a standard due diligence list looks like. It's, you know, it's available on the internet, you can ask your lawyers, or you can ask some of the friends, and, and that's what you reverse calculate from. You say, if this is what it's going to be, maybe the specific folders are going to be different, the names are going to be different, but at the end of the day, the due diligence list for most m and is, is very similar, so you can create a more generalized version from that. Uh, any additional, uh, no, the higher tech, uh, how to deal with toxic, existing toxic employees? Well, there's a reason why they are toxic. I think you want to find out where the toxicity is coming from. I think there's, there's probably a source of toxicity which you want to invest your time in. And after investing all that time, if you still find that, okay, it is indeed, say, with the, with the, with the employee, you need to have a very frank conversation. And at the end of the day, don't sit on that toxicity for too long, because it will infect. And it has a, a really a negative effect on not just you, not just the employee, uh, but the rest of the team. But 90% of the time, I have found that if it's, if it's an issue for, the, for you, it's very likely an issue also for that person. And, and having, a, again, a, a very frank, and this is where your element of trust also comes in, where you can be very frank about what is the issue and, and tackle it head on. Don't try to just think, oh, I'll push it and maybe the problem will go away. It will not go away. Uh, sorry, which one am I looking at? The, Christian, the higher ticked all the boxes, but down the road, one year later, for example, the candidate turns out to be toxic. Uh, I think we talked about that. Uh, I'll go to the anonymous one. How much time do you spend keeping in touch with the board, inform them, informing them about progress, etc.? It depends on the stage of the company, and it depends upon what you're going through. At, there are times when you actually, you as a CEO and a founder, can spend up to a third of your time dealing with the board and investors. If you really are trying to utilize them, for making, say, the deal happen, or you have a strategic deal going on, or financing. So it's not a specific percentage all throughout, but depending on where you are in the, in the life cycle of the company. But it's very, very important that you maintain the transparency and not have any surprises with the board. So a board meeting is great, but if you're revealing new information at a board meeting, something is already wrong in terms of your communication channel with the board. Uh, what should be in the identical hire contract that fits all. It's, it's effectively whatever your own contract is. If there's an employment contract that specifies these are the options that you have, are they going to vest, is there a double trigger, anything that you think is relevant for you is the same thing that is going to be relevant for the other teammate that you're going to hire for your other co-founder or for employee number 22, employee number 69, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, it is, they are thinking about the same thing. So I don't think there is a boilerplate. But whatever you are thinking about for your own self, as I said, the numbers are going to be very different. The numbers are never going to be the same because you are dealing with a meritocratic environment here. But the flavor is the same. For starting, uh, how do you deal with early hire who does not have the right cultural fit, but with good skills that the company needs at the moment? It's, a, it's an interesting question, by the way, because you do come across this situation quite a bit. One way in my mind to try to figure this out is the try before you buy. And the try before you buy is not just only for you, but also for the potential employee, the teammate that you're going to bring on. Maybe think of structuring a con on a contract basis. Or maybe you say, look, everything's there, but we are not quite sure about a you know, few of the areas. Why don't we start off on, on a contract, go for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, whatever the time frame is. And if it works out, great. If it doesn't work out, there is a checkpoint already in place to have the separation. Rather than saying, please come on board, and then if it doesn't work out, we'll just let you go you know, X amount of time. So if there is some room, it's a very hard one, by the way. And, and we've had to make some hard decisions where we actually said no to candidates when we felt that this is not going to work. It was very painful because everything had been checked off. 
but we just could not get the, the cultural fit to get going. But, but perhaps a, a contract in place for a short term to get it started may be the solution. If you were starting a company today, what would be the one and only one thing you would focus on in the first month? You know, that, that's a hard one in the sense, I don't think there is one and only one. You don't get to pick and Yes, everybody will say focus on the customer, only think about the product. But at the end of the day, if you are the CEO or you're the founder, you are going to be looking at you know, building the team, getting investors lined up, getting the product, getting the customers. I think the one thing that you are focused on is success. And that is the only thing that you're going to focus on. And, and that's all I can say. I mean, it's slightly a bullshit answer, but, but the truth is it, it, you cannot just say, oh, I'm only going to focus on product and I'm not going to worry about the team and I'm not going to worry about how to raise money. Those are all important components of getting it launched. It's the first month, you have so many things to do, you just have no choice. I, I think I've answered the questions here. Okay, Sanjay, I think uh, we'll wrap yeah. up here. Let's give Wonderful. a big hand Thank for you so our very final much. Give it up, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Thank you so okay. much. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you.